Okay, we're now live. So we'll just give everyone a couple of minutes just to, to come in and join us. Just whilst we're waiting, um, I'm just going to let you know that we're just letting everyone join in the webinar. So we cannot see you or hear you as participants, but hopefully you can see the five of us here today, the panellists for this session. Um, I'm just going to give it a couple of minutes just to let everyone filter in, get logged in. Sometimes it takes a minute or two um, and I don't want to, anyone to miss out on any information, so we'll just give it a minute. We've had a couple of connect, internet connectivity issues, so please bear with us um, if we have any delayed moments or just let us know if you need us to repeat anything at any point, if it breaks up or anything like that. We're going to try our very best for you, but sometimes the internet fails us. Okay, I can see that we're starting to, to level off there. Um, I think people are just filtering in a wee bit slower now. So we'll maybe make a start and um, hopefully if anyone else joins us after this, they'll be able to catch up. So welcome to our applicant event for BA Primary Education. My name's Leah O'Neill and I work as a recruitment officer within the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. And I'm joined here today by Monica, who is the BA Primary Course Leader. And then we also have three students with us today. So Holly, Samantha and Fiona are current students on the BA Primary Programme. So I believe that Monica is going to run through a couple of slides and the girls have got a couple of slides um, that they'd like to share with you today as well. And then we'll be happy to take questions at the end. So if you'd like to ask a question, you can do so by opening the Q&A box, which is just along the bottom of your screen. It's like two little speech bubbles. If you click on that, you can type a question to us. Now you can feel free to ask us a question as we're going through the slides, but we'll address all of the questions at the end, or if you'd prefer, you can wait until, until the presentation's over and send us a question there. But please don't be shy. We're happy to take all questions here today. And just if anyone missed it at the start to let you know that we can't see you, your cameras are off and your microphones are off as well. So the best way to communicate with us is through the Q&A. Now we'll just hand over to Monica then. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much, Leah. And I'm just going to bring up my slides just now um, and introduce uh, uh, the applicant event for the BA Honours in Primary Education. As Leah mentioned, um, uh, my name's Monica Pachani. Um, I'm not actually the course leader, <laughs> and I don't really want to be either, but I do work very closely with the course leader and what's called the academic selector. So my role is in selecting students onto the course. And that's why I'm going to highlight today for you the unique selling points about our course and what makes it um, a distinctive offering in Scottish education for initial teacher education in primary. Um, my details are there if anybody needed to contact me. Sorry, that dark blue maybe doesn't show up. So it's Monica Perchani at strath.ac.uk. You can also ignore the telephone number because we're not available by telephone at the moment. But certainly um, Twitter is uh, a common message of communication. Um, more for highlights of things that are happening in and around the uh, School of Education and the course. So what can I tell you about it? What would I say are the kind of, or what would we say as a course are the things that make our course distinctive? First of all, the School of Education is situated within the Haas faculty a humanities and social science faculty. So that's very much a key focus for us. And one of the things about being based within the faculty is that the first year of the course, and to a certain extent, part of the second year, part of the second year, you are part of the Haas faculty. And that means that in first year, 
that you take three subjects in first year. One is clearly going to be education. And then you take two other subjects from the faculty, from the social sciences faculty. And um, so you can have a look online and see which ones you might be interested in. And a lot of people at this stage are worried or thinking about, oh, what would be the best option? Now, there is no best option. The best option is the one that you feel either maybe builds on something you've done before. So it could be that you've been doing modern foreign languages at school. You could be doing French or Spanish and you decide that you want to continue with that to build up your knowledge and expertise. One plus two languages is a big area within a uh, primary education. So obviously that would enhance your skills as a primary teacher. Um, or it might be that you want to study something completely new and different that you feel this is an opportunity to move away from school subjects and do something completely new, such as social policy or law. Um, or it might be there's a subject like history that you didn't get to choose at school and you'd like to study that. Psychology is another area that many students find helps them understand the development of the child and actually orientates them in terms of primary education. Or it might just be that they're really interested in psychology. So there are lots of choices there for you to think about. What do you want to get out of your university degree? So in the first year, education classes are with, are with other students and particularly joint honours education students across the faculty. And um, the other thing about the teaching degree is it's a qualification. Our course is accredited by the General Teaching Council for Scotland. And that's really important because what that actually means, um, and our students who are sitting here with me today, are just about to find out what that actually means for them because they're in their final year and they will soon be registering with this body, the General Teaching Council for Scotland. So that is what anybody who works in education, in teaching, sorry, in primary, secondary, in colleges or in universities in a teacher education course have to be registered with the General Teaching Council for Scotland because they're the professional body that oversees the profession and they're called the regulatory body for teachers. And at the end of the course, they provide a certificate to teach. Um, once students graduate from our course at the end of fourth year, they're guaranteed what we call an induction year or a probationary year. So one year teaching as a probationary teacher is guaranteed as part of the course and part of our agreement with the General Teaching Council. So in September, our new intake of first years are about to start first year. X120 is the code that's attached to the students and it applied through UCAS as you've just done. You'll know that that's the code that's used through UCAS. Primary education students can expect a number of things to happen and let me First of all, highlight some of the things that are about first year and some of the things that are across the whole four years of the course. Placement in first year, and we're going to kind of come back to that in a few of the slides. I know Holly's going to talk about that in particular because our first year placement is quite different at Strathclyde than other institutions. We have what's called a community placement and students select their own placement and organize it independently by themselves. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to go out and find something with no help or support. There's a huge amount of help and support in organizations, voluntary, third sector, educational organizations that we have partnerships and we've worked with for a number of years that previous students have gone to. So there's a whole body of knowledge and people who are willing to take our students sitting there. Professional development opportunities are on offer. So the course itself and the modules that you go through do prepare you to become a teacher, a primary practitioner, but there's more to it than that. It's about lifelong learning. And it's also about students taking charge of that learning and organizing their own events 
to address areas maybe where we have a gap or that they'd like to know more about. And I know Holly's going to tell you a wee bit more about that as well. Just a bit more about the first year placement. What is that actually like? So the first year placement is requiring you to do 70 hours. It's with children or young people between the ages of zero to 14. And it can be undertaken anywhere that isn't a mainstream primary classroom. Students are encouraged to think about this in terms of either picking something that maybe takes you out of your comfort zone, gives you experience of a broader area, maybe of family life or of childhood than maybe you've had yourself. It can be to build on a strength that you've already got. Maybe it's like something to do with a sports coaching issue or an outdoor education, or it's about working one-to-one -one with a child, perhaps in a, a, a specialist center. And we'll hear a bit more about that later. And what you're asked to do during those 70 hours is to keep a placement portfolio. And why am I stressing this particular placement? Because this is quite unique to our university and to our course, and we think it's a strength of the course. We believe that it really helps students in the first year understand how other organisations work. They learn to negotiate, to find their placement, to set that up. They learn also to work in partnership with other adults, either at their placement or with parents or with other organisations. And that helps to develop their skills in terms of negotiating and just communicating with different people. Um, so that's a really important stage for us is to allow this skill development as you go through the four years at university. Another highlight of the programme is that every so often courses are reviewed and that's a natural part of any course at university. And the BA primary education was reviewed in 2019-2020 and we had our first new offering of this degree programme and that's the degree programme that you will be undertaking. The panel who reviewed the programme said that there was many outstanding features about the new programme and that in fact it was sector leading in the following areas. So these were the areas that the review panel felt made our course stand out and really offer the skills and the capacities that are required for a 21st century practitioner. STEM education is integrated throughout. Science, technology, engineering and maths, if you're not quite sure, you've not heard it like that. We have really strong links with other departments in the university through science and through the engineering partners. And in fact, we have vertically, they're called VIP projects or vertically, I'm not very good at saying that, vertically integrated programmes that build on experience throughout the years. Uh, last year we had students go to the Gambia, or sorry, maybe not last year, maybe it was the year before, before all um, the pandemic stopped any travel at the moment. And they were looking at sustainable development in terms of working with the engineering department with schools in the Gambia looking at solar panels. So that's an example of how things are not just about learning, it's about putting it into practice as well. We have a number of health and wellbeing programs that are integrated across the four years because health and well-being is a core element and a responsibility of all teachers. We have different offerings in terms of developing a modern foreign language um, and we'll talk more about Erasmus experience um, at the end by uh, Fiona and Samantha are going to talk about their experience. So in many respects Students can just do a generic programme that covers all bases, or they can decide that they want to specialise in a particular area and come out with a specialism in maybe STEM education or Spanish or French or another area. 
We have built things like outdoor learning and sustainability into the heart of the programme. So there's also opportunities in second year to take an interdisciplinary learning module that focuses on these other aspects of education. Overall, the kind of key skills and competencies that the General Teaching Council look for in practitioners, first of all, is that Scottish teachers need to be reflective practitioners. They reflect on their practice so they can develop their practice. And we start that right away in first year with this community placement where students are expected to develop their expertise and also to develop um, a reflective log on their placement experience. And that reflective log, right from the word go, starts off that whole experience. Professional dialogue by going to community placement, negotiating it, getting involved with people who work there at all levels of the, the, the placement, then they're starting off the course in terms of learning how to take part in professional dialogue. Many of the tutorials and seminars expect students to come along prepared to contribute, prepared to take part, to debate and discuss issues, okay? So it's a very interactive course and program. And what we're trying to do is to develop what we call teacher agency, so that you have the skills necessary to help children, to put the right things in place for children when you become a teacher. We also want to instill from the start this idea of that it doesn't end when you graduate with your degree, it's lifelong learning is what we're looking at in terms of your overall development. And we start that off ourselves by offering many supported learning opportunities. Another really important aspect as well is working collaboratively. So some of our assessments, different stages in the program are collaborative group work assessments where people work in a team and every team has responsibilities and decides how they're going to complete a project or a task. So those are also really important. More widely, students are often very interested to know, well, how do, what do we offer in terms of are there international opportunities? And there are a number of really, really good international opportunities. We, we're part of the University uh, Erasmus Programme. Erasmus stands for the exchange programme that exists between British universities and European countries. Clearly, with Brexit, that's going to change and it will be under a new name starting in 2023. But we're being assured that this programme will continue with the partner organisations that we're already working with, the universities in Sweden, the Netherlands, Belgium, Switzerland and Spain that we have an agreement with. And you'll find out a bit more about that in a moment. An Erasmus exchange is for a semester. Not everybody's interested or is able to undertake a full semester. So we have got other things that we offer. We have international study programmes, which are maybe of a shorter duration. Um, and we've had those in the past to countries like Malawi, the Gambia. And we have, um, for a number of years now, we've had um, a programme which goes to China um, in partnership with Nanjing Normal University. And we're hoping that that will resume quite soon. Shorter courses that maybe last a week are to Radboud Summer School, and we've had students go to Zwoll to a school in the Netherlands on an exchange programme. So I'm going to hand over now to Holly, and Holly's going to tell us a wee bit about her Strathclyde experience. And I'll do my best, Holly, just to move the slide on for you when I think it's time, OK? If you want to just hold up your hand, then I'll know, I'll watch you. OK, thank you, Holly. Thank you, Monica. Um, so, yeah, I just thought I would speak a bit about my first year placement experience. Um, as Monica said, it's a really unique opportunity that Strathclyde offer because 
you can basically think of what is something that you want to personally improve on or is there something that you would like to have had a chance at and you've not quite yet given it a go and um, so my first year placement was within the Donaldson Trust and um, the Donaldson Trust is a school in Lithgow for children who have learning difficulties and hearing impairments so um, a lot of them rely on using the sign language so um, your placement as long as it's not in a mainstream school, it can be in, you know, a school working with children with particular needs. So this school, for example, there were only 10 pupils at the time. Um, so I basically got an opportunity to work with them on a kind of one-to-one -one basis, learning all about sign language, learning about things that I hadn't really come across before. Um, so if you're okay to go to the next slide, Monica, um, I've just included a couple of pictures here. So for example, the first one where you can see the tent, um, things like sensory needs, a sensory room, all of this stuff was completely unknown to me when you know I began first year. I'd heard of things, heard of people talking about schools and, and using different approaches, but when I first went in, I thought, oh, you know, is this placement right for me? I don't really know anything. But actually within those seven hours you learn so much and because you go in to gain experience you um, create your folio and you just you learn so so much depending on obviously where where you choose to go and um, so for example if you were to choose to do a sports club or something like that your experience would be completely different but it's so valuable um, I found my experience has benefited me all throughout the four years at uni um, and I'll come back to that just in a minute. So other things like animal therapy um, at the school that I was at in first year they brought in things like animal therapy and we had rescue dogs one day and it was so great because it wasn't as if you know I was beginning this placement thinking I don't know where to start I, I don't really have um, kind of related experience to that it's great because you can go and you can get stuck in and, you know, um, see kind of different ways that education can make a difference to children's lives, um, not within a mainstream classroom. So I would say that is a really unique part of Strathclyde. And I know that I'm really grateful, you know, for being given that opportunity. Um, so I'll now kind of discuss on how that first year placement has really benefited me throughout my uni experience. Um, so the Twitter profile that you can see here is the Shackleyde Exe Group. Um, it's a student-led group that basically we ask students what they would like to know more about and we see what we can do to create different events. So um, we, myself and a girl who's currently in third year, of the primary education program, we decided that there was a need for learning sign language. So we offered um, an introductory course to British Sign Language. Um, and you can see that we had different students from all different years. We opened it from year one to four. Um, we allowed people to come along and learn about sign language. Now, if it hadn't been for my first year placement, this wouldn't have been possible. And if you told me in first year, you're going to go on this placement and then years down the line you'll run a club to other other students absolutely not um i feel with the first year experience your confidence grows as well because obviously you're taking responsibility of your placement um so it does it really does benefit so we had run the sign language class so people came along they then took their learning onto their own placement with them um, and out into the community. So it was really great and we got some really good feedback as well. Um, but the sign language is just one example of the EXI group have ran loads and loads of different um, opportunities. Unfortunately, this year, a lot of them have been online, but previously it was good opportunities to come onto campus out of your normal uni hours. So you could maybe come along to some evening sessions um, and for example, with the sign language class, you know, that was open to years one to four. So you're then sitting in classes with people from other years and it's it really helps the kind of social um, aspect and experience of uni. Um, so then on the final slide, 
they have put in. I just thought I would include the XE Twitter. If that's something that you're interested about, have a look on the Twitter to see the different opportunities. Because um, like Monica said, you know, the course provides you with loads of learning opportunities, but there are also additional um, experiences like XE. So have a wee look to see if there are different events. And um, you can also see some student feedback as well. And then I thought, I'll put my teacher Twitter just in case you've got any questions um, about anything that I spoke about. Okay, thanks very much, Holly. That's great. And that also shows you how we as a school of education use Twitter as a communication tool. You know, it helps us to promote ideas, to talk to each other, um, to share, to collaborate. Um, and Twitter for us has been a really good way to do that. So um, if you're on Twitter, um, uh, then have a look at it and just see. And it's also, it, you can follow some of the things that have been done more recently in the School of Education, okay? Now, the other area that we mentioned was, uh, the final slide that I talked about was going away and having what we call an Erasmus semester abroad. Now, Erasmus is something that the School of Education works in partnership with the Central Erasmus team at the university. And we have worked with a number of schools across Europe, schools of education, to set up an agreement where our students go to that country and their students come to us at Strathclyde. And as part of their exchange, we have set up an exchange where they also have a school placement opportunity. Now, unfortunately, last year's um, Erasmus exchange was um, cut short, but I'm very pleased today that two students who managed to take part in that opportunity um, are here today. So Fiona and Samantha are going to tell us a bit about their Erasmus experience, okay? So do you want to unmute yourself, Fiona and Samantha, and we can move on to your experience and you can tell them where you went to. Yeah, perfect. Um, so I'm just gonna try and chat more about like the application process and like before we even got there. Um, so in third year um, at Strathclyde, you'll get offered an opportunity, which we call Erasmus. Um, it's a term abroad experience where you can go and live in a different country for that full term. Um, and then you attend the university of that country and that area. So myself and Fiona did this last year. Um, we moved to Belgium in January last year. Um, and although our experience got cut short because of COVID, um, I would still highly recommend it to absolutely everyone. Um, so I think it was in our second year, we, there was lots of events like information events. Um, to attend and to get all the information about. So don't worry about that now, but um, definitely if you're even slightly thinking about it, just go along to the events and see what's said because um, I wasn't like 100% sure I wanted to do it. And then I went and it was, yeah, I was so set on it. Um, because what they do is they get students that have been the year before to come and speak to you about their experience. Um, and me and Fiona have done that on Zoom this year um, to talk to, other other students and that was what sold it because you can like hear about the experience from another student um, and see what life was like um, but yeah so we got offered places like Sweden, Belgium, Netherlands, Spain, Switzerland um, as Monica slide said and then there's also other international opportunities as well and um, so for the application it was quite quick and simple and we got a lot of um, support for it we just had to write about why um, we would want to go abroad and live in a different culture um, and obviously your countries, like the country preferences. So we had to rank the countries that we would most likely like want to go to. And luckily we both got our first choice and we went to Belgium together. Um, and you also have to just write a wee bit about um, like why you think you might be a good candidate to represent Strathclyde in a different country. Um, but it was a really easy app, like application and you just have to be totally honest. Um, so yeah, and then once you get a place, you get told where, where you're going. Um, and again, there's so many like information sessions and the staff and the Erasmus team and Monica are like, obviously email really quickly back if you have any small questions. Um, 
and yeah and just they help with all the paperwork we need and all the communication between the universities was all really easy and um, the university also provide a grant which can help like cover moving costs spending or living costs and um, it does depend which country you go to because for example like switzerland's a very expensive place to live and um, but ours was around a thousand pounds and you get like 80 percent of that before you go and then 20 percent when you finish your Erasmus and um, so that was a massive help like when we moved there and had to go get some stuff from Ikea and our rent and stuff like that as well so that was good and um, we went in the second term of university so we moved in January last year and um, and then you're supposed to be there till May um, I think or maybe June actually um, but yeah as Covid hit in March we were only there for about seven weeks but it was still just the best experience um, and if you want us going to talk to you guys a bit more about like what it was like when we were actually away. Do you want me to move on Fiona the slide? Um, yeah that would be good thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk to you guys about the benefits of going abroad. So one of the best things about it is the people you meet because you make friends with people all over the world. Although it's um, we're going as people from Europe, you also meet people from America and we had friends from America and like South Korea and stuff on our course. We actually lived in the same accommodation as them. Um, we stayed in studios, but we had like communal kitchens, which meant we could eat together and then we could also eat food from like other people's countries, which was really great. Literally like everyone's in the same boat as you, like everyone's just arrived in a new country. So everyone's so lovely. Everyone wants to make friends. Um, the other obvious positive um, is living in a different culture. So not only is everything a bit different, like the way you get about, like on transport, like in Ghent, in Belgium, everyone got around on bikes. We didn't, but um, most people rented bikes. I broke my elbow when we arrived. So that was kind of off limits for us, but most people did that and it looked really fun. Um, there's also something called ESN, which is like the student network and they plan like nights out and like day trips and stuff like that, like so that you can become more like involved with the culture. Um, and then obviously the food, like Belgium was amazing. There was like waffles, chips, like cheese croquettes, like all the food was so good. We ate so much. Um, it was obviously really good to experience the other education systems. So the university, although it was quite similar, um, like we had a lot of courses that obviously overlapped because it's education. Um, things were different, like we had a lot more modules there, but the assignments were quite a bit less demanding, quite sh a lot shorter as well. Um, there was a few differences, like here we get a word count for essays, whereas there we were told like two pages, that kind of thing, but it was all really interesting. Um, your placement will differ depending on where you go, but ours was twice a week, one day in a primary school and one day in a preschool, um, but that's what we chose. You could have picked like, um zero to three year olds as well, or other modules. Um, they do speak Dutch there in the schools, which obviously you have to really adapt <laughs> your teaching. We didn't even get really to do that, but um, so obviously like a lot of like visuals and like pictures and uh, body language and stuff, but it's obviously a really, really good experience to have. Um, and you get to like see the differences between our education system and there's like, for example, they go to school a bit later than us. So their first year of primary school, they're like six and seven, the children, but it's obviously nice to see like the difference. Um, another great thing is because you're on mainland Europe, it's really easy to travel. Like we did day trips. We went to like day trips around Belgium, went to Amsterdam by coach. It was like, I think we paid like 20 pounds or something. And it was like an overnight or like a really quick coach. So easy. We obviously had lots more places <laughs> planned that we wanted to go, but obviously that couldn't happen. Um, and yeah, as Sam said, even though our time was cut short because of COVID, we had the best time. We're still in contact with people from there. We're going to visit them when we can. <laughs> and we cannot, like, we cannot recommend Semester Abroad enough. It was really good. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, and I'm going to, we're now going to move on and uh, take questions. But before we do that, I just want to round up by thanking students for coming in in their Easter holiday. Um, and taking part today. That shows you how committed they are to, to um, supporting the course. 
they're all in the middle, so they're in their final year. And the last hurdle, hurdles that they have at the moment is they are um, just about to finish their dissertation. So that's the big extended study piece that you do at the end of your course. It starts off in fourth year and you write it across fourth year. I'm actually Holly's supervisor. So I've been um, listening to her. She's, she's um, been investigating and looking at child bereavement. So their students are just getting ready to submit their dissertation before they finish their, um, and they finish their final teaching practice um, or their teaching placement. And then um, that's really the end of the four year course. One or two other things just to highlight about the programme. We are trying to create a community that's connected and that feels they belong to Strathclyde. Um, and so we have a number of things each year has a year group convener that's there to give any kind of support to the students as well as to organise social events. Students need help or support in terms of well-being issues or adjustments in terms of their learning. Then we have a student well-being team within the School of Education and students who register with that will be assigned a well-being advisor who's there to help them should there be any need for extra support or help or sometimes it might just be a one-off thing where a student uh, needs to come along and get some help either with an academic, with a financial or with some social support. So we have lots and lots of services that are available at the university, but we also in-house are a first port of call to help students if they need any other kind of support. So those are some of the main features of our course. I'm going to stop sharing. I know that Leah has um, questions that you've been sending to the Q&A. And we'll all now be happy to answer those questions. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. That was very informative and it's very interesting to hear about um, everyone's different experiences. Um, so we've had a couple of questions come in. I'll just work my way through them. But if anyone else would like to ask a question as we're going along, please do um, just pop a wee question into the Q&A and we'll just work our way through them as they come in. So the first question was from John. And John has asked, I was told that Strathclyde aren't doing conditional offers this year. I wasn't sure if that was true or not. Thank you. So I can confirm that that is not true. So we have been issuing conditional and uh, unconditional offers, um, which is the same every year. Of course, we'll get many applicants who are in their, their final year at high school. So it's quite often conditional offers that we, we put out. I think, I think the only difference might be, it depends. Um, it's all down to, John, it all depends on how many. First of all, every year it depends on how many applications we get. And in primary education, we only have a, a set number of places because that's determined by the government every year uh, based on teaching numbers in the profession. So if we have... For instance, I think we have about 1,400, between 1,200 and 1,400 applications. Now, it all depends on how many of those applications meet the required entry uh, conditions. And that's happening more and more. So maybe there's not as many conditional offers as there may have been in the past. But it does vary every year, depending on how many people um, apply to the course. Great. Um, right, so another question. So in the first year, you can't do your placement in nursery or primary school, but you would be able to work alongside a sports club with primary age children, for example. Right, so you could do it in a nursery school. You are allowed to do it in a nursery school. We, we kind of encourage students to maybe think beyond a nursery school because very often the experience you'll get in a nursery school might not give you a huge range of skills because a lot of students, um, you get into a nursery school and maybe they're, they're helping out with small tasks, you know, taking children out to play outside. So you have to look beyond what you're doing as daily tasks and look at all of the other things that are happening in terms of supporting families, supporting children's learning um, and, and various other things like that. Um, but yes, you can work in a nursery you can take a placement in a nursery school or you can do it in a, a sports club with primary age children. Um, you just can't work in a mainstream primary classroom teaching because that's what we, the places are reserved for students in second, third and fourth year um, in primary schools. Okay, great. 
Um, I don't know, Samantha, Fiona, where did you do your place? Maybe that would give people some more ideas. Of yeah, so I did my placement at an outdoor after school club. So I would go along about half two and we would walk along to the, the local primary school and collect the children that attended the after school club. And then um, they would come into the, like we used a scouts hall, they would get completely waterproofed up and rain or shine would be outside building dens and fires and things like that. And it was on until about six. So I did that a couple evenings till the 17 hours, of course, yeah. Okay, what about you, Fiona? Um, I did like a paired reading. It was in a primary school, but it wasn't like teaching in a classroom so it was like kids that either didn't read much or at home so were like not where they needed to be or like um kids that had additional support needs that needed one-on-one -on -one help with reading so it was kind of in a school but not teaching in a classroom okay that's great hopefully that gives people a few more ideas of the different things that you can do um so Another question from an anonymous attendee. Does everyone get the opportunity to do the Erasmus or are there certain parameters around who can and can't go? Um, well, everyone can have an Erasmus opportunity should they wish, but there are some parameters. First of all, um, it, it is based on your average grade mark across first year. So you have to get an average grade across the whole year of 55% or above, okay? And you have to pass everything first time. And that's because Erasmus programme needs to ensure that students who are undertaking it are able to cope with, because there's extra learning pressures when you're studying at another university and you're also the university, also view it that you're representing the university. So yes, you do have to show that you're able to, um, to get that. And then I suppose the only limiting factor would be if there aren't enough places, but that hasn't actually happened for us yet. Okay, great. Um, April's asking, how long are you away when you're on your Erasmus study? So I think you said it was a bit different this year, but normally? Yeah, so normally it's a full term. So you go away, our term actually, I think it depends when the um, term starts for your university abroad so in Belgium it didn't start until early to mid-February after the Christmas holidays so we flew out a couple of weeks early in late January and Fiona I'm not sure was it supposed to be May or June it's the whole term but it was um, supposed to be May May yeah. yeah I think it does just depend on the term dates for the specific uni in the country you're going to but yeah okay great um so another anonymous question. So during placement while in Erasmus, do you complete it in international schools? Um, so it depends. So your age group, it would depend. Like some of them speak English. It's not an international school, but um, some kids will speak English and some won't. It depends on your age. In the preschool, I wouldn't say any of them would really speak English, but there were children in the primary school. So they were age six or seven and a few of them could speak English. Um, but your classes at university are all in English. Um, you can take, like, we took a Dutch language class to help us, but um, all the classes are in English, so that's quite helpful. I think it depends on the country as well, because in Belgium and, like, the Netherlands, they are generally very good at English anyways. So most of the other students, because we, we were working alongside Belgian students in group work for uni all the time, and all of their English was very good. Um, and all the lectures and stuff as well, as Fiona said. But um, yeah, the older kids in primary school probably can speak a little bit of English and they do have English lessons. But the days we were on placement um, with the like six, seven year olds, everything was being taught in Dutch and um, we just had to go with the flow and adapt and be flexible and just learn from it. So yeah, it was good. Great. So, uh, uh, Leah, just to round that off, all of the university agreements we have with Erasmus are all with universities that teaching English. Some of them, like Switzerland, the students do go to international schools. Other ones, like the girls have described, are in countries where, where there's generally a really good standard of English spoken from about eight or nine years onwards. Uh, and some, like Spain, they don't, they go into a Spanish school, but many of the students who go to Spain want to improve their Spanish, so they're quite happy with that. And they would be teaching the Spanish children English 
So that would be what they would be teaching the children. So it works really, really well for us, regardless of the country, okay? That's great. Okay, so for the other two subjects we choose, do we study all the modules of those subjects or just some? So I think they're referring to year one and asking yeah, about. No, and so in year one, if you were doing French, you would do the same French that all of the other French. So somebody doing a French degree, coming only to do a French degree, would do module French 1A and French 1B, and so would you. So you undertake it in the same way. It's the same course that all students undertake. Um, but you only take it in first year. Um, and then you can decide you may want to keep that up into second year, but you only take one of those subjects on into second year. OK. OK, great. Thank you. A question from Amy. Are you required to speak the language of the country you wish to study in? So I think you've kind of answered that. So yeah. that's a no. That's just so hard. <laughs> <laughs> hard no, no, definitely not. I bet you learned a lot of wee phrases and such in, in that language, though, in, in Belgium. We did. <laughs> um, okay, another anonymous question. Have any of the students here worked towards achieving the CTC alongside, alongside uni? So that's the Catholic teaching certificate. I'm not quite sure. Have any of you done that or know of anybody who's been doing that? No. Um, it is available. We have. We don't offer it, but students can do it because it's an independent uh, online course that's offered through Glasgow University School of Education. So we do have a number of students who have and are undertaking that module of study. Okay, thank you. Um, a question from Rachel. Is there an interview process after first year like the University of Stirling does, since there's no initial interviews to get into the university? Yes, there is. There's a transition process in, at the end of first year. Uh, the reason we do it then is to allow our students to have that first year placement experience to really sit and think about what does this career actually mean for me now that I'm here at university? And to decide, am I still committed to being a primary teacher? But we have as many places in second year as we have in first year, but there is a transition interview process and it helps students who don't want to continue to come forward and say, I've really thought about it. I don't think primary teaching is for me now that I've been in the course and I've tried it out. And therefore, we can then help them get on the right programme. Perhaps they'll just continue and do a joint honours in education. Um, as a preferred option. So it's more to help students make that right decision. It's not about, we're not trying to trip anyone up or we're not trying to stop anyone from getting on to second year. It's a quality assurance process. Does anybody want to talk about, anybody remember the first year interview? Yeah, I was just gonna add that it's really not a scary experience at all. It's really quite laid back and it's in a group setting. So. If you're currently doing um, interviews to get into uni, like I did a few for like Dundee and Aberdeen and stuff like that, and that was so nerve wracking because sometimes it's quite full on and things like that. But this interview after first year is really not like that. It's it's almost like you, I think you like present a speech or something. I you know I can't even remember. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't stressful at all. But um, yeah, no, it's a really easy laid back experience, so I wouldn't worry about it at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, great, thank you. Um, question from Rachel. Is there an inter... Oh, sorry, wait, sorry, I just asked that one. So, just so many questions. We're getting so many lovely questions here. A uh, question from Daisy. Sorry. For the first year placement, is the 70 hours split across a couple of weeks or is it throughout the entire year? Do you want to answer that, Holly? Yeah, so it's over um, a set number of weeks Obviously, some people do it, as Samantha said, um, you know, evenings or someone, some people do it Monday to Friday. So you're given a kind of window of opportunity as long as you make up your 70 hours, whether you do that over two evenings or you do it, you know, every day, um, Monday to Friday until you make up your hours. But it's, it's really good that way because it's completely flexible to suit your commitments and um, so yeah, it's over a set amount of time as long as you make up the 70 hours altogether. 
Great, thank you. Are community placements and school placements assessed? Also, how many assessments exams take place across the four years? So, yes, every module you do in university is assessed in some way. Um, so every time you do a module, and there are three modules in every term, so that's like every year there are six different assessment types from individual presentations to essays to exams. I think we only have two exams in our course, and that's for numeracy and subjects like numeracy. We also have group presentations and we have individual presentations. So there's a variety of techniques used for assessment. You are assessed on placement, and I'll let one of the students talk about that. But for the first year community one, you're not assessed on the placement, you're assessed on your reflection on learning of what you've learned about in a portfolio that's submitted as a formal assessment. Okay. Um, Fiona, do you want to talk about what, what's the school? How are you assessed when you're out on school placement? Um, so on school placement, although it goes towards your credits, it's not like you don't get a grade for it. So it's just pass or fail. Um, and you always, if you fail, you get like a, a, like a reset or something to come back and try again. And it's always like a little thing. Um, you're assessed on your folder, which you have to put like your lesson plans, your reflections, your, what you've done each day. It's a, like a, a big piece of work. Um, and then you're also, you get an observation where a tutor from the university comes out and they watch you teach a lesson and they talk to your Sometimes they talk to your pupils in your class and they also talk to your class teacher and then you get um, your feedback from them. And yeah, the folder is a big piece of work, but it's actually really interesting and it really helps you to get to know your school and your class and obviously the curriculum and everything else. Good. Okay, thank you very much. Question from Natalie. Due to COVID, it has been hard to get experience in primary schools. Is experience important in this year's application? No, we're not looking for that in this year's. We understand that it's it's been difficult to get any kind of experience, so that has not been looked for in this year's application. If people have had experience or some experience, that's absolutely fine, but it's not something that we require. Um, a question from April says, what are other examples of placement people take part in? So I'm not sure if maybe April asked that question before we had to be chat about that, but I don't know if there's anything else you could add to that. I can give you a few more examples. So we've got students who've done things like worked, um, volunteered at the toy box in Berlin prison or have volunteered at... Um, uh, doing outdoor learning type in an out... Well, Samantha talked about an outdoor nursery, but who have done... Uh, kind of sports coaching um, but there's there's a vast array a lot a lot of students this year because a lot of it's online are doing voluntary tutoring online um, are working individually with one a child maybe at a homework club and um, working at break uh, volunteering at breakfast clubs and um, so a whole range of work with voluntary organizations and um, or with parents groups, you know, um, I had some students a few years ago who volunteered with Crossroads, which helps, it's an organisation which helps parents with postnatal depression, and they were working with the children while the parents attended a counselling session. Okay, hopefully that gives them a couple of ideas. Also, um, just to add there, in first year, I remember we had a lecture that was really helpful and um, the tutors offer a kind of list of opportunities that are available so I think a lot of us maybe felt you know we want to do something relevant to us but we couldn't really think of anything at first but there are opportunities to discuss and see what's out there so that if you're totally stuck on what to do there are kind of opportunities yeah. offered to you as well. Mm -hmm. That's great thanks Holly. Um, Another question, does the course start earlier than other courses at university? No, no, it starts freshers week is the same for everyone in induction week is the same for everyone in the faculty in the university. Thank you. Um, I had heard that there was an interview at the end of first year about whether you remain on the course. Is this true? And if so, how many students make it on to second year? 
and what can you do to secure your place? So I think we've answered the first. Yeah, we've answered that, and there's as many places there's as many places in second year as there are in first year, but we do have some people who decide not to proceed because they feel it's not the right course for them, and we also have students who, for other reasons, we don't think are right for the course. Maybe students who have not engaged with the course, haven't attended, and also maybe who have failed some of the modules that they really need to, and they, we make a decision at that point that perhaps they haven't shown the level of commitment that we would expect uh, for primary education. And um, we, we look at helping them find another course. Okay. There's another question about the 70 hours and how that's broken down, but we've already yeah, we've answered that. Um, I was wondering when offers will be sent out by so that would be the offers of study. So as per the UCAS um, guidelines, we have until the 20th of May to, to make all of our offers for applications that were submitted by the deadline. The deadline was the 29th of January. Um, so it's a rolling process that offers or applications are assessed regularly and offers are made regularly, but we have officially until the 20th of May. That's extended a wee bit. It's usually a bit earlier than that. I can't remember the, the normal date, but it's the 20th of May this year. A question from Ava. For placement in second, third and fourth year, do you get given a school and is it based on the area you live in? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So you have to put in your um, term address and then the rule is that you can get placed up to 90 minutes traveling time from there. Um, but that's like the most extreme. Um, I, none of my friends have been ever that far um, and it's mostly been pretty local schools. Um, and also the university can help cover travel expenses as well. That's great. What module subjects do you do in your second and third year? I would suggest go on to the course page on the, the website because there's a lot of different subjects and modules that we offer across the four years. And actually there's a breakdown there of each year, second year, third year and fourth year. But you do a mixture of modules that teach you about teaching, like educational studies, and modules that are about curriculum subjects that you'll teach in the curriculum, and then also about getting you ready for going out and placement. Those are the three kind of areas that each year covers in different ways, but you'll get a breakdown of the exact modules on the course page for the BA Primary Education um, on the website. And I can post that link if you want, Leah, just now. Um, yeah, that would be great. Right, I'll keep on asking the questions as well. Just to say, I'm just going to head off. I, I need to be gone. Hey, that's great. That's, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Fiona. Bye. Bye. I was actually sorry. There's, a, there's, a, there's quite a lot of flexibility as well. Like every year we have um, compulsory modules that everyone on the education year will take. But then there's also um, some choices that can be made in the modules every year. Um, so like this year I did a science module, but I know other people did religious and moral studies. Um, and that kind of thing so it's quite good for you can kind of look back on the year before and think oh what what did I miss out on that year and I'll, I'll try and choose something to kind of fill those gaps of knowledge. That's great yeah sorry just for a wee time check there is only there's two minutes left but we can continue answering all of the questions if unless anyone has to to dash off but just let us know if, if you do have to dash that's absolutely okay. Um, right, let's fire through these then. Okay, we've answered that one. How long are placements second to fourth year? So your second year placement, um, please keep me right if I get this wrong. Your second year placement, you have your serial days. So you'll go out to your school um, for just a certain amount of hours a week and then it gradually builds up. So it's not as if your second year placement you're jumping from 70 hours to a full-time teaching placement. It's you're kind of gradually introduced. Um, so you have your serial days, which you get to choose which days suit you. Um, and then it goes into a three-day week, then a five-day week, um, if I remember correctly. So three-day week and then five-day week. So that is 
a primary one to four placement in your second year um, and it gradually builds up and then your third year placement you would do a primary four to primary seven placement um, and then it again gradually increases so you will have your initial serial days where you go and meet the school meet your class and then it gradually increases to eventually you're there for um six full weeks I think um so obviously you, you then get to experience being in a school full time and then in fourth year this year we've had um, we didn't get our serial days because of covid but we're currently in schools for it works out 10 weeks altogether um so but throughout all of the placements you get an opportunity to initially meet everyone and then like I said it, it builds up so you will you will eventually be in the school full time and um, but there's lots of support for for getting to that stage okay that's great uh, right we've answered that one sorry there's some there are doublers that are coming in um where can I find a list of subjects I think that's sent out in the, the pack I think the first year subjects are sent out in the uh, first year registration pack that you get okay because I think the subjects can change so they don't really advertise it until you've been offered a place and you get a registration pack okay great um right I've answered that one about offers being sent out are there any examples of interdisciplinary modules you can take? Yeah. So there's there's a lot and it ch they change um, every year but some of the ones that we were offering students this year there's one on um uh, inter outside le outdoor learning and learning for sustainability. There's one on uh, creativity subjects, so that's music and art. There's one on moral and ethical uh, decision making. Um, so there's quite a wide range um, of modules that are offered. There's one on folklore, fairy tales and storytelling. So quite a wide range across quite a uh, um, a kind of disparate area within, but loosely about things that will help in teaching as well. Hmm. Sounds very interesting. Um, are we required to have a PVG before coming on to the course? Not before coming on the course, but you're talked through that in first year. You have to have it for your placement in first year and you're helped to do that. How do the placements after... Oh, no, we've answered that one. Um... How many people in lectures at one time? It varies in first. Do Holly, you go. <laughs> no, no, it was just that previous question I had said about it being in Glasgow or hometown, but same with a similar question, it will always be kind of local to your area. Um, even from first to fourth year, it will still be a local school. Yeah. In lectures, they vary. It depends on the subject and what you're studying. So. Psychology, for instance, a lot is really popular in first year, so a lot of people study it. So those are quite big lectures, um, two and three hundred. Um, and some, if it's just a course lecture for primary education, it might just be 150. Um, so they do vary enormously depending on the subject you're studying. Okay. Great. What local authorities are placements in for second, third and fourth year? I yeah live in West Lothian. Yeah, there are, we, we have partnerships across the whole of Scotland. So yeah, there's, there's um, placements. We work with the West partnership, so it covers all of the West. Um, but we also have students in placement in Lothian, in Edinburgh, and the Borders. Um, and we even have some students who are further north than that just now. Yeah. Uh, is it likely that a lot of course delivery will be online? Well, we, we haven't really been told yet moving forward. We believe that there'll be a mixture of blended learning. So perhaps some of the lectures, you know, we have a lot of lectures that start at nine o'clock in the morning. So we're anticipating that rather than everybody have to come into university on the rush hour to get to university for nine o'clock in the morning, that actually we'll be able to do a live lecture online at nine in the morning. Um, but they'll come in for the tutorial, the top part for their tutorial groups will be on campus but we've not really until the government have not, are not I'm just thinking about it we're not at the stage yet where the government have said what's happening but I do believe I heard something just the other day that the government have said that university and colleges can resume teaching classes so we will find out more about that 
has moved from this, the end of this academic year and preparation for the next academic year. I'm sure we'll get lots of information about that um, in the near future. How many days will generally, will a student attend university? So maybe one of the girls can give an example of your year last year. So it actually does really depend. Um, it's been different all over through, all through uni. It's, it, and I think you can be quite, not tactical about it, but you have to sometimes choose the days and times you do your tutorials on. So most of the lectures will be set days and set times. Um, and most of the time they're the same time every week but again that can change sometimes too but say if you're in like you've got lectures Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and maybe a Thursday you would just try and choose your tutorials to also be on that day so you could maybe try and get the Friday off or something like that but it doesn't always work out like that and I know like the further you go on with university it's a bit more full-on and when you've not got a class you're, you're probably in the library or something <laughs> so yeah it's it's not really an easy one to answer. Um, okay, question from Jenny. Is there a choice of where you can go on placement? I think, Samantha, you well, can... Only in first year, yes. only in the first year. No, not in the other years, yeah. Um, are you given set days that you're required to be in uni? So no, I've just answered that. Yeah. No, it can really vary. Although I would say like the university, obviously, because it is a full time university degree, you are kind of expected to be available and yeah. to do the work necessary yeah. on yeah. Monday, Friday, nine to five. Um, and like and that's, that's, yeah, that's what we say. It's a full time course, Leah, um, Monday to Friday. And also it might be that you don't have a class, you're not expected to attend a class, but you may be working a group project. And that's when the other students can come in. So you can't get out of it by saying, oh, I've got a job to go to. I've got to do this because you're part of a collaborative team and you're expected to meet up when everybody set a date that suits everybody. And um, so you have to be available. Um, and there's a lot of coursework and course reading. So as, as, as um, Samantha said, then you would be in the library preparing in between classes. Yes. Okay, um, how many places are in the course this year? How many, what's the capacity generally? About 152 places we have on the course this year, but you know, we have about 1200 applications for those courses, those, those places. So we're still working our way through sending out offers. How likely am I to receive an offer if I meet or exceed all of the entry requirements? If you meet or exceed the entry requirements, chances are that you will receive an offer. But um, I guess that will depend on once we see what our full uh, applications are, then we know because we obviously can't exceed that 152. So within the next three or four weeks, we should be getting most of our offers out. I think it's important to say, Bill, it's not just about the, the academic qualifications. It's... No holistic view when viewing applications so it's about the personal statement um, for teaching etc so yeah. it's not just about that so it's hard to you can't really say that you, no. you can't necessarily it's the reference and the personal statement and the qualifications it's three things that we take into consideration um a question from daisy is there an opportunity to do a master's degree afterwards Yes, um, in fourth year, the credits that our students can get, they can get additional credits that count towards uh, a master's degree. And within the School of Education, we, we run a number of master's programmes. So sometimes there's help, there's, um, if you apply, you know, straight from doing your undergraduate, you get a discount on some of the modules when you do the master's. So we really do encourage students to think about that. Um, and to use some of the credits and the discount towards coming back and doing a master's degree. Um, and we have a, a number of master's programmes that we run in the School of Education as well. Yeah, if you're thinking ahead, you can look on the website at our postgraduate yeah. offerings if you want to. But of course, you'll be given support at the time, won't you? Uh, towards yeah, the absolutely. So we've read that in at the end of fourth year. We talk more about that at the end of fourth year. Um, have you been able to 
of a part-time job at the same time as being on the course? Maybe the girls can answer that one. Yeah, definitely you can. Um, there's all your evenings and weekends and things like that as well. And if you have quite a flexible part-time job, then it's also an added bonus because say if you do have a day off or an afternoon off, you can accept shifts, but you just have to be aware that like if something pops up last minute that you need to then be flexible so that you're not letting a group down or a tutor down or something like that. But you definitely can do a part-time job. I would just advise that it's not that many hours and it's quite a small job rather than something that's too full on because you'll just end up feeling quite overwhelmed trying to work and trying to do like all your assignments at the same time. Yeah, um, just agreeing with what Samantha said and I think as well that, so for example, I worked in a restaurant in the evenings and weekends um, throughout of first and second and most of third year. But I did find that when it was on placement, I wanted to fully commit myself to placement, especially when it starts to pick up and you're expected to be in the school, because obviously in your evenings and stuff, there will be times where you would like to plan. So I think, yeah, just totally agree in there that as long as you have a flexible job, maybe um, small hours of commitment, because at the end of the day, you know, there are certain points in the uni semester that will be busier than others. Um, so it's great to have a part-time job alongside it, just there are certain times where um, it might be best to take on less shifts than, than others. Great. Okay, that's a, a good one for um, Holly and Samantha. What made you decide to, to choose Strathclyde primary teaching over other universities? Um, so I was actually a second time rounder for UCAS. I applied for UCAS and didn't get any of my five. Um, so did a gap year and came back and applied. I actually hadn't applied to Strathclyde the first time and then I'd come across the course a bit more in depth for my second application and thought I would apply for that. Um, I actually never went to any of like, the events like this, but after doing like, loads of research online, it seemed like a really good course. And I was really happy that you could do placement all four years. Um, that, was a, that was a big thing because I just loved being out in school. I'd done loads of work experience during my gap year and throughout the last years of my like, senior school. So I didn't like the thought of going in and just doing loads of lectures and stuff. Um, and Strathclyde has been like really practical. Um, as Monica said earlier, there's only been, I think I only sat two exams and one was for numeracy and one was for my other subjects in second year psychology. Um, so for being on a four year course and only being in an exam hall twice um, has really benefited me because I've never really been an exam person and Strathclyde's like allowed me to do a lot of like collaborative group work and kind of learn from others and obviously being on placement a lot is a, a great benefit. Well, Absolutely. Yeah, just totally being there um, and also having that first year opportunity, being able to kind of seek your own placement. I would say another thing that had sold, another random thing that sold Strathay to me was that um, within the library on the top floor, um, there's a resource center, which hopefully will be after COVID, hopefully will be open to be used again. But it's, it's the little things that I feel that at Strathclyde, you know, the effort between the staff team and um, and all the staff at the uni, it just, it really does make a difference. Um, so the resource centre is basically a section of the library that is set up kind of like a classroom. So you've got your smart board and you've got your resources and all of the reading materials um, and teaching materials as well. So, you know, if you're going in and thinking, I don't even know how to work certain things, you can go in there and it's with other teaching students of all years. Um, and I know that I've mentioned that to people at other universities and they don't have something like that. Um, so the resource centre at Strathclyde is great because it's also um, sometimes a place just to go and speak to other teaching students to ask questions. Um, but yeah, and the location as well, the, it's really practical right in the city centre. Um, and yeah. That's great. Um... I would also add the sports centre. I've not been in yet because of COVID, but it's literally brand new and the gym looks insane. And um, I've been in last 
before Christmas for a drama module I was doing because we were using the dance studios but it's such a good resource to have literally on campus um, and it's like right next to the halls of residence as well and the library so everything's like really small and close together because like a lot of other universities their campuses are really spread out and you have to almost get like buses and really long walks to get between things but everything's a five minute walk at Strathclyde and all the buildings are right next to each other and um, so yeah I would say that's another thing and the library is really good as well like lived in there <laughs> <laughs> and if anyone's thinking about that if they're not able to stay in halls throughout uni I have traveled from home all four years and um, traveling into the city center and there's parking right next to the library and um, there's loads of kind of availability there so it's never been a problem for me because it's about a five ten minute walk to Queen Street um, to get the train so it's it's really handy as well and um, for anyone thinking of commuting in from home. Okay thank you. Um, how do the offers get worked through? Is it alphabetical by area or first applications that were handed in? No, nothing like that. It's actually to do with the categorised because there's so many different categories. So some are by hires, some are by HND or college courses, some are by um, our widening access programme. Um, so it's all those different categories are worked through um, at the same time. What help do you offer at the university for students that might struggle? So I think I've covered that. I think I said, you know, we have the student wellbeing team and they help with adjustments, learning adjustments. And they also there's a disability and wellbeing service. And you can see that online. Um, students should register if you have, I'm going to just say, for instance, if you have dyslexia or, um, you know, a learning uh, need, then you can register with a disability service and have, have adjustments put in place. Or you can come and speak to the student wellbeing team. But you get told all of that during your induction process so you know exactly where to go if you do need help. Great. I think they are available to chat to if anyone is feeling, you know, we don't want you to feel worried about coming ahead of that ahead of time. So if you want to kind of chat to someone about additional needs that you're aware of that you have right now, then you would be able to do that in advance. And I'm sure they're here as part of the applicant event. I'm trying to find the link. I will find it at the end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But they should be here to have a wee conversation with, or of course you can send them an email. But mm -hmm. there's plenty of ways that we can help you. A question from Ava. Did you both stay at home while studying or did you move into halls and what do you think is best? So did you, did you, you said you came from home. Holly, do you stay in halls, Samantha, or have you? Um, no, I, I wanted to go into halls, but um, I think there's a rule that you need to be at least three miles away. And I, my parents live just on the other side of the river. So um, I was like two point something. Um, so no, I lived at home for first year, but Fiona, who was here before, we've been friends since Freshers. Um, she was in halls. Um, I'm not too sure about the application or that kind of thing, but um, I was in there a lot and they're a really great way to meet people. So if it's an option and you're thinking, about it I would just say go for it because there are a lot of ways to meet people um, and yeah so. <laughs> I think I think if you can afford it and you're able to I think halls gives you a slightly different experience that you probably meet a wider range of people outside of your course quicker um, and you get to know lots of other students so a lot of students have said to me yeah they did meet people on their course they become really friendly but the real people they met were people in their halls of residence uh, that they would do things with at the weekend and I think it gives you just a slightly more separates home from um you know you know brings you straight into the heart of the campus and to be a student and immerses you in that so it's a great experience if you can manage to get that yeah that's the difference as well because when you go into halls you're not just with people on your course it's from ev everyone it's a complete mix um, and they're all like some, some are um same sex and some are mixed I'm not too sure um, but yeah, it was it was great. And even just because sometimes you have like an hour break between lectures and tutorials. And if you're not going to halls, just make friends with someone that's in hall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was great. But I moved out. Good tip. Was, um, I've lived out of home from second year. So yeah, it's good. 
Okay. The, again, the accommodation team are available to chat to um, across the next couple of weeks. So if you have any specific questions about all the different aspects, what kind of halls there are, and yeah, is it same sex, is it en suite, all of that, you can ask them that. We're also having a chat to a student session on Thursday, and one of the people who's joining us is from the US, and he lives in halls. So if you want to come along to that and ask him questions, um, that's the chat to our student session on Thursday. You can do that as well. Uh, when can you accept offers that have been received? So that would be a UCAS thing. I think once you have all of your... Once you get an offer, you can accept it Sweet. from the minute you get it, yeah. yeah. I think yeah. So you have the opportunity to make your firm choice and then your insurance choice. You have to make your choice, and I don't know the dates because I can't remember what it is, but it's usually about the end of May, the 31st of May, you have to have made your... You, you have to have accepted an offer by then. There's a deadline for accepting it, and you're told that within your offer. yeah. These are all dates that were held to by UCA, so it's not yeah. specific to Strathclyde, it's across yeah. the board. It There's is. been a lot of changes this year because of COVID. Right. So it's, I'm just trying to get the right date here. It's uh, the 10th of June this year. You're right, it's normally right. the 31st of May, isn't it? So it's been extended, maybe because of the exam situation in the SQA and everything, to sort of make sure that everything's done and dusted before that. But you should, you'll be told that when you get your offer, I would imagine, from UCAS. Yeah, you can also at any time check the UCAS website. So I'll just pop this into the chat. So there's a key date section on the website, which gives you all the all the dates related to anything to do with responding to offers or um, making decisions and all that. They're all on there. So that was our last question. We'll just hang on for a wee minute, just in case anyone's got any last questions to, to throw at us there. Um, otherwise, you can email us if you go away tonight and think about something or later in the week, you can feel free to send us an email. I'll put the general e email into the chat function as well. You should shared your email address, um, Monica, but I'll just put the, the general one in as well. If you are wanting to contact us, remember to include your UCAS ID so we can Check your application. Oh, here's another one. Did anyone join any socials? I think they mean the clubs, like societies. And do you have time for them? There's loads of social clubs. Um, we've got students who have also are on, um, maybe are part of an elite sports team and maybe on sports scholarships. So we've had international um, students who play internationally. I think we had somebody, I can't remember, sorry, it was it netball? Um, and uh, yeah, so we've had somebody that played uh, netball competitively internationally, but we also have students who join lots of clubs like that, like the hockey team. A Wednesday afternoon is um, a, a time in this, the, the calendar. Sorry, we should have mentioned that. So Wednesday afternoon, we keep free. We don't normally have classes on a Wednesday afternoon unless you're out in placement. School placement actually takes over at that point. Um, but you are entitled to time off. Say, for instance, we've had to book a class on a Wednesday afternoon or there's a placement class. We have to allow the students to take part in, say, for instance, they're in the hockey team or they're in a sports team and they're, they're competing as part of that, you know, with other universities that are in a university league, they're entitled to, to a Wednesday afternoon off to go and do that. So we don't normally have scheduled classes on a Wednesday afternoon, and that's the time for social, many of the social groups, sports and social meet on a Wednesday afternoon, sometimes in the evenings as well. So there's, there's virtually hundreds of um, different social uh, clubs and events that meet at the university. Um, did any of you, have any of you, Holly or Samantha, been part of anything formal? No, it is something I wish I had um, participated more, especially in the sports ones, because with our new sport kind of facility, it's, it gets yeah. such, people talk so highly of it. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm the same. I never actually got around to doing anything, but I wish I had, because it was, it seems like such a nice environment to be in. Like, one of my friends, Samantha, as well, she's, um, now she's in fourth year, she's the captain of the cheer squad. Um, but she started cheer when she, in first or second year, I think it was, and it just seems like such a nice environment and community to be in because you end up doing things out with university and you meet a lot of new people. So there's definitely a lot of opportunities for it. 
Definitely. Um, I think a lot of students, maybe they don't join a club, but they do join the sports centre and they go regularly. There's a massive amount of classes and clubs and sports facility and sports things on at the sports centre. So I think a lot of students maybe do that um, as well. And there's also a lot of um, events and things on at the student union building. So people maybe go along to the student um, union and do something maybe an event or a talk or something at the student union or a music thing um, when that's fully operational again. Yeah. Yep, there's a lot going on. I think we have still been doing loads online throughout COVID as well. So there's still a lovely student community that's very vibrant and active. Even so do we want to finish? There's a good one to finish it. Mm -hmm. Holly yes. and Samantha, what one would you say has been your favourite module or a module that you've really enjoyed? And that you've not mentioned so far. Do you want to go first? <laughs> um, that's a difficult one. Um, I think one that's I've got. Can I have two? Um, yes. One, one that I really liked was um, a model in second year, and someone had mentioned it. It was um, like a moral, moral and uh -huh. philosophical. Um, Ethical issues. Mm -hmm. Ethical issues, yeah, which to me was really interesting because there were a lot of subjects that related to, you know, teaching the subjects. For example, you'll get opportunities to study science, PE, digital technology. Um, but the moral subject for me, it was really interesting because on placement, you'll face a lot of opportunity, like a lot of experiences that maybe people don't agree the same as you or thinking about cultural differences and personal experiences so I think that was really interesting to me because it was a kind of discussion based subject um, that really opened my eyes because I think before that subject I was quite naive to a lot of things um, but it was just really interesting hearing from other students how they would kind of you know approach different moral dilemmas um, and in that course you get an opportunity to do a group presentation to discuss a moral issue um, so I would say that one and um, so learning for sustainability um, in first year was that I think um, so that that was really good um, it was opportunities to go out into the kind of community local to university um, or kind of local to Glasgow, um, it was really good because it allowed you to see learning opportunities, you know, how you could take learning outside. It was something I didn't have experience of. And it's good because you get to go with your friends on the same course and you go and see learning opportunities. Um, for example, we went to, so there was like the Children's Woods in Glasgow, um, the Athens oh, Village. Um, I think we went to as well. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Loads and loads of different um, kind of days out opportunities to learn as well. I would say those were my two kind of stick out modules. Yeah, so I really enjoyed that side of it as well. But there was a lot of things like when I was in high school, I just absolutely hated science and maths and all things that. And actually looking back on my university experience, all the kind of STEM subjects modules have been my favourite. Um, I think because it challenged me a lot and, and I, I was very arty at school and I thought I was going to go into being a teacher and be very like arts and drama and things like that but we had a module last year I think it was Holly in, first ter in the first term in um, science technology and ICT and I did um, you did like one of the three um, and I was doing the digital literacy and um, and so it was so useful and so glad I did it because now being out in school in our Glasgow Council area in an upper school class um, kids all have an iPad and we use the iPads all day every day well not all day every day but most we try and use them all like a lot and um, so that really helped because one day and um, Apple genius guys from Buchanan Street came in and showed us like loads of different things we can do as teachers um, and told us about the Apple teacher program as well. Um, and then at the end of that module, one person from science, one person from technology and one person from digital literacy came together to then create a sequence of lessons to try and use all three um, on the same topic, which was good because we could then learn from each other. Um, and then in the first term of this year, I kind of, as I was saying earlier, like kind of looked back on my university 
experience and realized that I hadn't really had any science input yet. So I chose science as my optional module. Um, and although it wasn't in a lab, a lab like it normally is, um, I still learned so much from the, the tutors on that module. And I'm now planning a science <laughs> forward plan for my placement this year because I was just so excited about doing it. So it definitely, all the modules definitely push out your comfort zone and make you realize that you'll love teaching like all the aspects of, of the curriculum rather than just the ones you thought you'd like. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so thank you both to Monica and Holly and Samantha and Fiona before she, she had to dash. But um, hopefully we've answered everyone's questions today. And if you have any other questions, then we're always um, able to get in touch with us via email and we'll do our best to get back to you. And hopefully we'll see some of you in uh, September. So thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. thank you. Getting lots of thank yous still coming in, that's nice. Yeah.